We've been told for years that fiber is a must have for gut health, and that without it, your microbiome will crumble faster than a stale bran muffin. But what if I told you, you don't actually need dietary fiber at all? Do you really need to eat fiber? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman. Welcome back to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional misinformation online. In this video, we're going to be talking about fiber, the facts and the myths. And the video is given by a medical student at Harvard who, well, may have graduated by now. And Nick Norwitz is a PhD, now MD, and does a lot of videos and collects information about topics on health and nutrition, including low carb keto diets. You might know his Oreo cookie experiment, self-experimentation where his LDL cholesterol went down more on Oreo cookies than statin drugs. Yeah, it's a pretty radical thing. So I, I like his style and the way he researches things, but let's see what he has to say about fiber. And, and be sure to stay to the end of the video where you hear my final thoughts. Fiber might not be as essential as you've been led to believe. Is that a shock to you? You know, the fiber, like a bad penny, is kind of comes and goes and comes back and then gets put down. And, and in my mind, it was never really an issue. Back in the day, the idea was you needed fiber and it would protect you against colon cancer and polyps. And so when that was finally studied in a large randomized control trial, fiber did not help to reduce colon cancer and colonic polyps. And yet you still hear vestiges of that in some circles. So I come at this with a video, with my preconceived notion that you're going to have to prove to me that fiber is necessary and important because I'm in that position of I, I'm not convinced yet. I'd like to give a big thank you to our friends at Element for sponsoring today's video. Element offers a fantastic science-backed mix of sodium, potassium, and magnesium essential electrolytes for anyone on a keto diet. In particular, their raw, unflavored version, which comes in the blue, teal-colored package, is a great choice. This specific version contains no stevia, no sugar, or any additives, just the three vital electrolytes your body needs, already perfectly measured for you. It's an excellent addition to a keto diet, and more importantly, it tastes great. As you may know, electrolytes play a crucial role, especially for those following a keto or carnivore lifestyle. Element is giving you the chance to try it out with a free sample pack included in any purchase. That means you'll receive eight single serving packets at no extra cost with your order. It's a perfect way to test it out and even share Element with a friend. Get yours now at drinkelementy.com slash ericwestman. This special offer is only available through my link, drinkelementtcom slash Eric Westman. You'll also find it in the description below. Now let's get back to the video. Inflammation. Some people argue that fiber-rich foods are anti-inflammatory, but that's not entirely true. For example, a landmark randomized controlled trial published in the journal Cell found that some people were inflammatory responders to dietary fiber meaning when they ate fiber, they had more inflammation. Reading straight from the paper, taken together, these data suggest divergent immune system responses to the high fiber intervention, with high inflammation participants exhibiting broad increases in steady state immune activation, which means inflammation. So has it ever occurred to you that maybe one size doesn't fit all? Yeah, so for the longest time, a low fat diet was promoted as the healthiest diet and that's kind of faded away. And even if you think back 50 years ago, no one talked about the gut microbiome and people could be healthy. And, and actually the approach that we teach that minimizes the vegetables and, and you might get two cups of leafy greens, one cup of a non-starchy veggie, the reduction of inflammation is, is visibly there. So the idea that now we have a new thing to measure and to study and to get grant money for and to make products for, to ma manipulate this thing called the microbiome, 
has become, you know, such a distraction to me <laughs> that I just, you know, until you can make some sort of claim or change within the context of a low carb diet, I'm kind of not listening too much. It's apples and oranges. So on a low carb diet, you're already reducing a lot of that inflammation and also the noise of the microbiome and things can improve with you taking away things not just adding things. And yet I know it's human nature to want to take something to get better when you're really getting better by removing the offending agents. In this case, it could be vegetables. Microbiome diversity. One point that's often raised is that fiber depletion or elimination will decrease microbiome diversity, which is a presumed marker of good health. We're gonna unpack that in a moment. And this is fair speculation at a population level. In fact, it's even speculation in which I myself have engaged. However, there are deeper nuances that I heretofore haven't gotten into. So just to say that in a different way, the idea is that if you have a diverse microbiome, meaning the, the gut bacteria, the bacteria I have, uh, there are a lot of different types and, and amounts. And it, I was at a meeting once where the world expert on the gut microbiome explained that the normal healthy microbiome is like a jungle with the different uh, colors and different flora and fauna and different microbiome. And I'm thinking, hmm, the jungle, that's, that's, there's things there that are poisonous and dangerous. You know? so, and then, you know, click the next slide is here's a desert and this is the microbiome on someone on a low carb or carnivore diet. And he's saying it's not beautiful, no color. And I'm thinking that's where I go to be calm and, and you know, resorts are in the deserts and it, and it can be beautiful. It's just a different kind of beauty. So be careful. This is kind of a, a theme we'll see where because it's different, it has to be bad or because it's different, it can't be better which, you no, know, if it's different, it's just different. Years ago, I started talking about the difference between driving on the left-hand side of the road and the right-hand side of the road, because when you teach someone a diet like this, it is almost that different. And, you know, it might feel wrong to be eating differently like this, to not have pasta, for example, to not have the fiber that you think you need. And yet it feels wrong to be driving on the other side of the road if, if even if someone else is driving you. And feeling is because you won't even try it if it if it feels like it's going to be harmful or, or if you're anxious about it. So, not to worry too much about fiber here. And and the science is even saying some people get worse. And so that makes me think as a practitioner treating you know an individual in front of me, I don't want to make things worse. First, microbes in the gut can feed off more than just fiber, and eating a low fiber diet does not necessarily lead to decreased microbiome diversity. For example, in one impressively comprehensive case study, a man who had been on a carnivore diet for four years had his microbiome compared to that of omnivores and plant-based people. In reading from this study, the comparison showed surprising results. The carnivore's gut microbiome did not stand out with regards to alpha or beta diversity, indicating that it did not lack richness or diversity when compared to its omnivore counterparts. And the study also reads, our study indicates that adherence to a carnivorous diet does not cause detrimental changes in the gut microbiome. Instead, it suggests the effects on the gut microbiome are due to combined influences of dietary regime and lifestyle rather than just meat consumption alone. Further research is needed to identify which components of the carnivore diet could act as prebiotics in the absence of plant-derived prebiotics and maintain gut health over time. Granted, this is a case study, but even an N equals one is sufficient to make the point that even with complete fiber elimination for four years, the microbiome doesn't just get starved off. It's not that simple. Yeah, and the end of one that Nick has done on himself is fascinating, and yet that needs to be grown into more and more people and clinical research for the establishment to kind of 
agree, okay, we'll sign on to it. But it's something you can check on yourself. It would be very interesting to have a mechanism, maybe the Citizen Science Foundation, Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz, who would have uh, 100 carnivores, carnivore eaters uh, send their poop for microbiome analysis. Uh, be interesting. And then you compare it to the poop of the microbiome of the other people who eat carbs. That's, that's what would be needed to kind of create a, what is the normal look like for those who don't eat plants? Okay, moving on. Short chain fatty acids. Another criticism of low fiber diets is that they will reduce levels of beneficial compounds made by the gut called short chain fatty acids or SCFAs for short which are the products or thought to be the products of bacterial fermentation of dietary fibers. However, when we look at the human data and consider the physiology, the story evolves. For example, in a 2024 randomized controlled trial comparing people eating a low fiber ketogenic diet for 12 weeks to people eating higher fiber diets, short chain fatty acid levels, including the key SCFA butyrate, were not reduced on the ketogenic diet after 12 weeks. Well, so in short, the idea that you have to have fiber is not being supported, even looking at the microbiome, meaning the gut bacteria that result on different types of diets. It's the total dietary pattern, not, and, and whatever else you're putting in, not just the presence of fiber or not that affects the microbiome. Important to bear in mind that every person's circumstance is different. And some people may be dealing with gastrointestinal conditions that could actually benefit from fiber reduction or even complete fiber elimination. In some cases of irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, fiber elimination can actually improve constipation. Yeah, and our paper on IBS with diarrhea predominant was published, I don't know, 15 years ago, where 15 people in a row had, I think it was 15, don't fact check me too much here on this one, it was a long time ago. But basically they all got better with symptoms and, and even validated questionnaires on a low carb diet, the IBS. In fact, I kind of joke that this kind of diet it would elimination, eliminate the, the gastroenterology field because the low carb keto carnivore diets reverse reflux that's common medicine I take away, the heartburn reflux medicines, takes away the IBS, irritable bowel syndrome kinds of things. And even there's a strong signal that this would be good for inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but that's a grassroots signal that's not been put into the literature except for case series of 10 people. But that, that's a start. Wow, what a the powerful response that can be and how this can change the GI tract, the microbiome, and the symptoms that people have. As reported in this widely circulated report, where those who stopped fiber intake completely had increased bowel movement frequency and 100% elimination in symptoms of bloating and straining. Sounds pretty good if you have IBS with constipation. Of course, the main side effect that people tell me about when they transition from a high carb American diet to a low carb keto diet is having fewer bowel movements. And in a lot of people's minds, that means constipation. No, it doesn't matter how often you go, but if the stools are hard or hard to pass, that is a transition symptom for some people. And we have ways to help people, the salt replacement, the milk and magnesia or other magnesium replacement temporarily so that when you're fully adapted to this way of eating, this is what you see, is that you have fewer bowel movements, but they pass just fine. And for those with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, fiber elimination can also be beneficial. In fact, treatment-resistant cases of Crohn's disease are pretty responsive to fiber-free diets and can be prescribed and promote remission in 60 to 85% of cases. The mechanism is thought to have to do with changes in the microbiome, particularly in an intestinal pathobiont called mucus beryllium, as has been reported in this paper in Cell Host and Microbe, which you can read if you want more. Of course, Nick's personal experience was reversing ulcerative colitis in himself. So he didn't come to this from a weight loss, diabetes reversal issue. He came to the low carb keto 
lifestyle because of ulcerative colitis, which is a life-threatening condition that causes uh, even bleeding in the, the, in the bowels coming out. So the idea that this could be helpful for severe issues like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is now being sort of uh, marginalized because there are medications that are super strong and can pretty much take away the symptoms of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So what I would love to see is taking people at diagnosis and randomizing them to either the strongest diet known to reverse these, aka the low carb keto carnivore, and or don't worry about the diet much, uh, but you can use medications. So that would be, you bring people in, you randomize them so they don't have a choice, the doctors don't have a choice either, and see if the diet is as strong as the medications today because the current medical practice is to just use the medications. They're so strong and so good, you don't have to focus on the diet so much. But another way to start a study like this would be to talk about what Nick said, the treatment resistant people. So if you're on medicines, that aren't controlling the Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, then try the diet. And that could even be done in a research setting ethically because the, you're not withholding a treatment, you're actually helping add on another treatment. In my practice, I see people whose symptoms are gone on these really strong anti-inflammatory bowel disease medicines. And doctors are reluctant to take away a medicine that, that in their minds made the cure when it really wasn't the cure, it was the stopping of the symptoms that people are having. So you can see it's complicated to, to introduce in a research setting a diet when the doctors are focused primarily on medication treatment. You might even get a group of doctors who say it would be unethical to withhold this drug treatment when actually the diet may be as powerful or more powerful than the drug itself. And of course, there is our case report in which 10 people on a carnivore diet went into complete remission from inflammatory bowel disease. Now, I'm not saying our case series is gold standard evidence. I think it's pretty good. It's not an RCT, but there's no denying that these patients, these human patients benefited and lives were saved. These are real people with real stories. So what's the bottom line here? Fiber isn't inherently good or bad. It's about context and individual responses. Your N equals one story, your N equals one microbiome. While fiber can be beneficial for some people, others may actually thrive on a low fiber or even zero fiber diet. Gut health is not one size fits all. It was interesting to see the young researcher coming at this without any real regard to the problem and controversy from the earlier time in, in my career. I'm glad he didn't talk about the colon cancer and the, the because that, that was debunked and shouldn't be in the, you know, zeitgeist or, or the thinking today. You're not going to be preventing colon cancer by having more fiber. If your doctor is saying that, they were taught by the same era that I was taught and they didn't get the memo about the randomized trials showing that that does not help to restrict, restricting fiber and not having fiber does not cause colon cancer or prevent polyps, although a lot, or even diverticulosis or diverticul, uh, diverticulitis. But there's the old saying that doctors practice the way they were taught in training. It's good to see here that the, that whole, oh, why did I even bring it up? It's good that he didn't talk about that, but now we have the microbiome to kind of disentangle or, or just don't worry too much about as my final bottom line is if you're feeling well and you're eating great nutrition, your gut's gonna adapt and, and change and in general get better when you cut the carbs down. If you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and look out for new content on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, consider joining our YouTube membership for early access and exclusive live Q and A's with me. Just click the join button below or support us with a PayPal in the description.